From Sanders Theatre in Cambridge, WGBH brings you the 1963 Godkin Lectures, sponsored by the Graduate School of Public Administration, Harvard University. This series of three lectures will be delivered by Clark Kerr, President of the University of California, and has been given the overall title, The Uses of the University. Tonight's lecture is the first in the series and is called The Idea of the Multiversity. Clark Kerr will be introduced by Nathan M. Pusey, president of Harvard University. Dr. Kerr's two other lectures in this series are titled The Realities of the Federal Grant University and The Future of the City of Intellect. As president of the University of California, Dr. Kerr directs the education of over 58,000 students on seven campuses in the state. Before he became president of the university in 1958, Dr. Kerr was chancellor of the university at its Berkeley campus. The Godkin Lectureship is administered by the faculty of the Graduate School of Public Administration. The lectureship was established in uh, 1903 by friends of Edwin, Edwin Godkin who uh, wished to, that his memory should be kept alive in this institution. Godkin was a British-American journalist, the man who founded the nation, and he was at one time uh, the editor of the New York Evening Post. Uh, he's identified with uh, using journalism to advance many good causes in the uh, latter decades of the 19th century. Well, the deed of the gift, his friend set this lectureship up in his memory, was to, to have lectures here to deal with the essentials of free, free government and the duties of the citizen, or some part of that subject. Certainly in today's world, higher education is a matter of first importance in public policy. And the subjects of the lectures this year, I'm sure, would be something that would mean a great deal to Mr. Godkin were he alive. Also, I'm sure he would be impressed by the qualifications of the man who's been chosen this year to give the Godkin Lectures to speak on this timely subject. When I think of what it must be to be president of the University of California, I just shudder. I try to, <laughs> I try to uh, think, imagine what it could be like, and I see it something like this. Suppose someone had the responsibility not only for Harvard, but also for MIT and the University of Massachusetts and BU and BC and Amherst and Williams and maybe Northeastern and Brandeis all put in one. Now, what would you do in a situation like that? And yet that's the kind of a job that uh, Mr. Kerr has. The only difference, of course, is that the constituent units are further apart in California than they would be in this uh, imaginary analogy that I've contrived here. The only position I can think of that would be worse for a man in university administration to have would be to be the vice chancellor of the University of Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta has uh, 100,000 students compared with California's 60,000 and many fewer dollars, so I can think that would be a worse, worse job. The President Kerr is a great leader among the university presidents of this generation. Surely he has one of the most difficult, most challenging positions in the, that any one of us could have in the world. And he seems to handle it with, uh, certainly handles it with great efficiency and also apparently with uh, great ease. President Kerr is a distinguished economist and a skilled labor arbitrator. He is a scholar and a teacher of note. Uh, and has made his mark already as, a, a, as one of the leading administrative officers of this generation. He did his undergraduate work at Swarthmore College, then pursued graduate studies at the London School of Economics and at Stanford before taking his PhD at the University of California in 1939. He's taught in a number of different institutions including, uh, besides the Berkeley campus, the University of California, the University of Washington, and Stanford. He became the chancellor at the Berkeley campus, the University of California, some years ago, and held that office for six years, 
and has now been president of this great statewide institution since 1958. It's a source of great pleasure to me to know that he is one of us and that he has an honorary degree from this university and we welcome him back tonight as an alumnus of Harvard as well as these other many institutions. His three lectures, first tonight, one tomorrow night, and the night following, are all concerned with the university, and the general overall title is The Uses of the University. The subject of the lecture tonight, the first one, is the idea of the multiversity. President Kirk. President Pusey, Dean Price, and ladies and gentlemen. When President Pusey was introducing me, he said that he would shudder at the idea of being president of the University of California. I would shudder at the idea of being president of Harvard University. As a matter of fact, uh, the jobs are not entirely dissimilar. We both face, as do university presidents generally and college presidents too, the same types of problems, the same types of complexities. The only difference is at the University of California, we put an extra zero behind our problems. <laughs> it's a very great privilege to be the Godkin Lecturer at Harvard, to take part in a series that has known so many distinguished predecessors. My lectures will be concerned with the modern American university, and I should like to begin by paying a tribute to Harvard itself. It is both the oldest and the newest of American universities. It has led reformations and counter-reformations with equal effectiveness. It clings to the old ideas so steadfastly, yet grasps the new with such agility. It attaches another's best faculty members to itself with such adroitness that one almost feels honored at their departure. <laughs> As a member of what would likely be considered a rival institution, I might wish to speak of Harvard as the first among equals, but it has no equals. We all stand in the length of its shadow. Now, I know it's customary at lectures of this sort, at least at the University of California, for there to be something of an audience the first night, a few old friends the second, and the couple that brought you the third. <laughs> So it seems prudent to survey the total series briefly in advance. <laughs> the title I have chosen is The Uses of the University. This title implies a general optimistic tone, for it is not the misuses of the university that we shall be mainly talking about. It also implies the university is a useful and functional part of its society rather than something apart. Universities in America are at a hinge of history. While connected with their past, they are swinging in another direction. The first lecture, the idea of the multiversity, relates how the university in the United States has moved from its British to its German to its more distinctly American phase. It discusses how the university is governed, if governed it may be said to be, and how life is different in the multiversity than in the Ivy Halls we read and dream about. The second topic, the realities of the Federal Grant University, concerns the impact that federal aid has had on certain American universities and what should be done about federal aid and the universities in relation to it. This discussion views the university at the current moment in time and federal policy as it now exists and is proposed. It takes issue with some aspects of the central current proposal for federal policy, the proposal of President Kennedy, and even with a few of the emphases in the report on Harvard and the federal government. To understand a university, it is necessary to view its future as well as its present and its past. In the third lecture, the future of the city of intellect treats with the process of change in a university and the clear and not so clear directions of current change. To visualize the longer future of a university, it is necessary 
to visualize the future of a nation, a society, a culture, a civilization. And some concluding questions are raised about the role of intellect in this longer perspective. The university has been a quite unstudied institution until very recently. Professor Seymour Harris, who is here this evening, is one of the first of my fellow economists to treat education as one might any other activity of society and to subject it to economic analysis. Currently, however, education, including higher education, is being scrutinized as never before and in all its aspects. This reflects a belated recognition of its uses in economic growth, in international competition, in political and social, as well as cultural development. One can only wonder whether the university was a better place before people began writing and talking so much about it, before they became so conscious of its uses. Were it a cadaver, the university would by now have been cut into ribbons and mutilated beyond recognition. Yet much of the current dissection is conventional and in all candor, often irrelevant to the actual situation. One of the most distressing tasks of a university president is to pretend that the protest and outrage of each new generation of undergraduates is really fresh and meaningful. In fact, it is one of the most predictable controversies that we know. The participants go through a ritual of hackneyed complaints, almost as ancient as academe, while believing that what is said is radical and new. The same may be said about faculty declarations of loyalty to the Guild and nostalgia about the golden age that never existed, the golden age of complete independence and total support. Actually, the university finds itself in a quite novel situation. It faces the situation with few precedents to fall back on, with little but platitudes to mask the nakedness of the change. It needs more reliance on contact with reality and less concentration on illusions than it often gets. Part of the reality is the recognition that new knowledge is the most important factor in economic and social growth. We are just now perceiving that the invisible product of the university, knowledge, may be the most powerful single element in our culture, affecting the rise and fall of regions and even of nations of professions, and even of social classes. Another part of reality is that the university is being called upon to help to arm one society against another. I speak here not only of technological research for national defense, but also of the psychological army, the social insights, the expanding skills of social self-knowledge that are becoming available. A further aspect of reality is more internal to the university. I refer to the very nature and quality of the university. Old concepts of faculty-student relations, of research, of faculty administration roles are being changed at a rate that has no precedent. And this at a time when it seems that an entire generation is pounding at the gates and demanding admission. To the academician, conservative by nature, the sound made by the new generation often seems like the howl of a mob. To the politician, it seems a signal to be obeyed. To the administrator, it is a warning that we are in new times and that the decisions we make now will be uncommonly productive, both of good and ill. So my defense of speaking of the university rests, first, on the grounds that it has come to have a new centrality for all of us, almost as central for those that never see the ivied halls as for those that pass through them or reside there. And secondly, this new centrality takes place at a time when the university itself is swept by tides of change. Now I should like uh, this evening and tomorrow evening to uh, present the two lectures in the usual length, and then the Thursday evening, the final evening, to condense my remarks into shorter compass, and then turn to such questions or comments as those in the audience may have. I realize, I might say in advance, that some of the things I'll be saying, particularly in the second and third lectures, may not uh, find entire agreement among all of you. I realize that some of them are controversial. And I cannot expect that you will treat me 
as favorably as did one of my students a few years ago. I was teaching my course in industrial relations and uh, I gave on the examination only a single question and the question was to the students, if you were the president of a large corporation and you had this extraordinarily complex and difficult problem which I then set forth, what would you do? And most of the student, students sat there thinking for a while and frowning and then starting to write. And one student uh, looked at the question and smiled, wrote a few words, folded up his blue book, came up to my desk and handed it in. And I wondered, uh, I was quite curious as what was in this blue book. Uh, I thought perhaps the question was so difficult he couldn't possibly answer it, then why was he smiling? So I opened the blue book, and this is the, what I found there. It said, if I was the president of this large corporation, and I was faced with this enormously difficult problem, there is only one thing I would do. I would call upon Professor Clark Kerr as my consultant and do exactly what he told me. <laughs> I might say I had some trouble grading that paper. <laughs> didn't seem to me like he'd done enough work for a really, really good mark, but I couldn't find it in my heart to say that he was entirely wrong. <laughs> I should like to turn now to the first of the lectures, the idea of what I have called a multiversity. The university started as a single community, a community of masters and students. It may even be said to have had a soul in the sense of a central animating principle. Today, the large American university is rather a whole series of communities and activities held together by a common name, a common governing board, and related purposes. This great transformation is regretted by some, accepted by many, gloried in as yet by few, but it should be understood by all. In approaching such an understanding, it may be of some interest to contrast the idea of a multiversity with some earlier ideas about the university. And I shall make brief remarks about the idea of a university as set forth by Cardinal Newman in 1852 when he was founding the Catholic University of Dublin on the model of Oxford University from whence he had come. And also, to what he called the idea of a modern university set forth by Abraham Flexner in 1930. And instead of the academic cloister of Newman, he saw the idea of the modern university as being a research organism based upon the model of Berlin University and the other German universities. But Cardinal Newman, in his idea of a university, was in part fighting the still active ghost of Bacon, who 250 years previously had argued that knowledge and instruction should be to the benefit and the use of men. And to this Newman replied, the knowledge is capable of being its own end. And he was opposed to research in the university. He was opposed to what he called useful knowledge. He said that useful knowledge was a great deal of trash. And he wrote, the university training is the great ordinary means to a great but ordinary end. It aims at raising the intellectual tone of society, at cultivating the public mind, at purifying the national taste, at supplying true principles to popular enthusiasm and fixed aims to popular aspirations, at giving enlargement and sobriety to the ideas of the age, at facilitating the exercise of political powers, and refining the intercourse of private life. It prepares a man to fill any post with credit and to master any subject with facility. This beautiful world was being shattered forever, even as it was being so beautifully portrayed. By 1852, when Newman wrote, the German universities were becoming the model for the world. The democratic and industrial and scientific revolutions were all well underway in the Western world. The gentleman at home in any society was soon to be at home in none. 
science was beginning to take the place of moral philosophy, research the place of teaching. The idea of a modern university, to use Flexner's phrase, was already being born. University, said Flexner, is not outside but inside the general social fabric of a given era. It is not something apart, something to story, something that yields as little as possible to forces and influences that are more or less new. It is, on the contrary, an expression of the age, as well as an influence operating upon both present and future. It was clear by 1930 that the universities had changed profoundly and commonly in the direction of the social evolution of which they were part. This evolution had brought departments into universities and still new departments, institutes and even more institutes, created vast research libraries, turned the philosopher on his log into a researcher in his laboratory or the library stacks, taken medicine out of the hands of the profession and put it in the hands of the scientists, and much more. Instead of the individual student, there were the needs of society. Instead of Newman's eternal truths in the natural order, there was the discovery of the new. Instead of the generalist, there was the specialist. The university became, in the words of Flexner, an institution cons consciously devoted to the pursuit of knowledge, the solution of problems, the critical appreciation of achievement, and the training of men at a really high level. No single individual could any longer master any subject. Newman's universal liberal man was gone forever. But as Flexner was writing, the modern university, it in turn was ceasing to exist. The Berlin of Humboldt was being violated just as Berlin had violated the soul of Oxford. The universities were becoming too many things, and Flexner complained, they are secondary schools, vocational schools, teacher training schools, research centers, uplift agencies, businesses. These and other things simultaneously. They engage in incredible absurdities, a host of inconsequential things. They needlessly cheapen, vulgarized, and mechanized themselves. And worst of all, they became service stations for the general public, even Harvard. It is clear, calculated Flexner, that of Harvard's total expenditures, not more than one-eighth is devoted to the central university disciplines at the level at which a university ought to be conducted. I wonder what he would calculate today. He wondered, who has forced Harvard into this false path? No one. It does as it pleases, and this sort of thing pleases. But it obviously did not please Flexner. He wanted Harvard to disown the Graduate School of Business and let it become, if it had to survive at all, the Boston School of Business. So also, with all schools of journalism and home economics, football and correspondence courses, and much else. The modern university was as nearly dead in 1930, when Flexner wrote about it, as the old Oxford was in 1852 when Newman idealized it. History moves faster than the observer's pen. Neither the ancient classics and theology nor the German philosophers and scientists could alone set the tone for the really modern university, the multiversity. The idea of a multiversity has no bard to sing its praises, no prophet to proclaim its vision, no guardian to protect its sanctity. It has its critics, its detractors, its transgressors. It also has its barkers, selling its wares to all who will listen, and many do. But it also has its reality rooted in the logic of history. It is an imperative rather than a reasoned choice among elegant alternatives. President Pusey wrote in his last annual report to the members of the Board of, Gov of Overseers that the average date of graduation of the present board members was 1924, and he said that much had happened to Harvard since 1924. Half of the buildings are new. The faculty has grown five-fold, the budget nearly 15-fold. And then quoting, one can find almost anywhere one looks similar examples of the effect wrought in the curriculum and in the nature of the contemporary university by widening international awareness, advancing knowledge, 
in increasingly sophisticated methods of research. Asia and Africa, radio telescopes, masers and lasers, and devices for interplanetary exploration unimagined in 1924. These and other developments have affected such enormous changes in the intellectual orientation and aspiration of the contemporary university as to made the university we knew as students now seem a strangely underdeveloped, indeed a very simple and an almost unconcerned kind of institution. And the pace of change continues, and not only at Harvard. Another American university, my own, last year had operating expenditures of nearly half a billion dollars, with almost another hundred million for construction, a total employment of over 40,000 people, more than IBM, and a far greater variety of endeavors. Operations, counting campuses, experiment stations, agriculture and urban extension centers, projects abroad involving more than 50 countries, all together in over 100 locations. Nearly 10,000 courses in its catalogs. Some form a contact with nearly every industry, nearly every level of government, nearly every person in its region. region. Vast amounts of expensive equipment were serviced and maintained. Over 4,000 babies were born in its hospitals. It is the world's largest purveyor of white mice. It will soon have the world's largest primate colony. It will soon also have 100,000 students, 30,000 of them at the graduate level. Yet less than one-third of his expenditures are directly related to teaching. It already has 200,000 students and extension courses, including one out of every three lawyers and one out of every six doctors in its state. And Harvard and this university are illustrative of many others. Newman's idea of a university still has its devotees, chiefly the humanists and the generalists and the undergraduates. Flexner's idea of a modern university still has its supporters, chiefly the scientists and the specialists and the graduate students. The idea of a multiversity has its practitioners, chiefly the administrators, who now number many of the faculty among them, and the leadership groups in society at large. The controversies are still around in the faculty clubs and the student coffee houses, and the models of Oxford and Berlin and modern Harvard all animate segments of what was once a community of masters and students with a single vision of its nature and purpose. These several competing visions of true purpose, each relating to a different layer of history, a different web of forces, cause much of the malaise in the university communities of today. The university is so many things to so many different people that it must of necessity be partially at war with itself. Now, how did the multiversity happen? No man created it. In fact, no man visualized it. It has been a long time coming about, and there's a long way to go. What is its history? How is it governed? What is, it li what is life like within it? What is its justification? Does it have a future? Well, the multiversity draws on many strands of history. You can go back to the Greeks, which has more than one strand, beyond Plato's academy, where truth was pursued for truth's sake. There were also the sophists teaching the useful skills, the Pythagoreans concerned with astronomy and mathematics, and a good deal more. However, the university as we know it could be said to be a distinctly medieval institution. And while at once, once upon a time it was a progressive force in the early Middle Ages, the universities came over the centuries to be more really centers of reaction in Europe than of progress. There was something almost splendid in their disdain for contemporary events. They stood like castles without windows, profoundly introverted. But a rebirth began in Germany, particularly with the University of Berlin in 1809, with a great emphasis upon the new science and upon research also German nationalism. This new type of university spread to the United States, chiefly through the efforts of Gilman at Johns Hopkins, beginning in 1876, Elliott Harvard in 
1869, with their emphasis upon the graduate schools and research, and also the land-grant movement of 1862, with the emphasis upon agriculture and on industry. The counter-revolution against these developments was occasionally waged. Lowell at Harvard emphasized the undergraduate houses and concentration of coursework, as against the graduate work and electives of Eliot is a commentary not just on Harvard, but also on the modern American university, that Eliot and Lowell could look in opposite directions, and the same institution could follow them both and glory in it. Universities have a unique capacity for riding off in all directions and still staying in the same place, as Harvard has so decisively demonstrated. <laughs> At Chicago, long after Lowell, Hutchins tried to take the university back to Cardinal Newman, to Thomas Aquinas, and to Plato and Aristotle. He succeeded in reviving the philosophic dialogue he loves so well and practices so expertly that Chicago went on being a modern American university. Out of all these fragments, experiments, and conflicts, a kind of unlikely consensus has been reached. Undergraduate life seeks to follow the British, who have done the best with it, in an historical line that goes back to Plato. The humanists often find their sympathies here. Graduate life and research follow the Germans, who once did best with them, in an historical line that goes back to Pythagoras. The scientists lend their support to all this. The professions and service activities follow the American pattern, since the Americans have been best at them, in an historical line that goes back to the sophists, the social scientists are most likely to be sympathetic. Lowell found his greatest interest in the first, Eliot in the second, and Conan in the third line of development and in the synthesis. The resulting combination does not seem plausible, but has given America a remarkably effective educational institution. A university anywhere can aim no higher than to be as British as possible for the sake of the undergraduates, as German as possible for the sake of the graduates and the research personnel, as American as possible for the sake of the public at large, and as confused as possible for the sake of the preservation of the whole uneasy balance. <laughs> Should I like to turn to the subject of the governance of the multiversity and some of its problems? The multiversity is an inconsistent institution. It is not one community, but several. The community of the undergraduates and the community of the graduates. The community of the humanist, the community of the social scientist, and the community of the scientist. The communities of the professional schools. The community of all the non-academic personnel. The community of the administrators. Its edges are fuzzy. It reaches out to alumni, legislators, farmers, businessmen, who are all related to one or other of these internal communities. As an institution, it looks far into the past and far into the future, and is often at odds with the present. It serves society almost slavishly, a society that also criticizes, sometimes unmercifully. Devoted to equality of opportunity, it is itself a class a society that also criticizes, sometimes unmercifully. Devoted to equality of opportunity, it is itself a class society. A community like the medieval communities of masters and students should have common interests. In the multiversity, they are quite varied, even conflicting. A community should have a soul, a single animating principle. The multiversity has several, some of them quite good, although there is much debate on which of its souls really deserves salvation. Flexner thought of a university as an organism. In an organism, the parts in the whole are inextricably bound together, not so the multiversity. Many parts can be added and subtracted with little effect on the whole, or even little notice taken or any blood spilled. It is more a mechanism, a series of processes producing a series of results, a mechanism held together by administrative rules and powered by money. The multiversity is a name and a spirit. I might say this means a good deal more than it might seem, because the name carries with it the institutional character, a certain level of quality as associated with the name of Harvard. 
The university is also a place, or increasingly, as in the case of the University of California, a series of places. Now, Hutchins once defined the university rather differently. He said that the modern university was a separate series of separate schools and departments held together by a central heating system. <laughs> in an area where heating is less important and the automobile more so, I have sometimes thought of it as a series of individual faculty entrepreneurs held together by a common grievance over parking. <laughs> Multiversity is also a system of government like a city or a city-state, the city-state of the multiversity. It may be inconsistent, but it must be governed, not as the guild it once was, but as a complex entity with greatly fractionalized power, and there are several competitors for this power. There are the students, who once upon a time, as in Bologna, had all the power, and when they did, they treated the masters really dreadfully. And there are remnants of the Bologna system in Latin America by way of Spain and Salamanca, but by and large around the world there is little residue of the sole authority which the students once had in the first of the uh, great universities of the Middle Ages. The second contender for the power is the faculty itself. The faculties also once upon a time and in more places than the students themselves had the totality of power within the universities. And it still remains fairly substantial, but historically, I think it is safe to say that the power of the collective faculty has been declining. The authority and influence of the collective faculty has been going down clear around the world. Organized faculty control or influence over the general direction of growth of the American multiversity has become quite minimal especially in the case of the Federal Grant University, which I'll be talking about tomorrow night. And that whole development really grew up outside of faculty control. Individual faculty influence, however, has been quite substantial, even determinative, in the expanding areas of institutes and research grants. And I think it's interesting to note that while the power of the collective faculty and its influence has been going down, that perhaps the individual faculty member has had more influence over growth than was true in earlier ages. Still, it is a long way from Paris at the time of Abelard. Beyond that, there is also the growth of public authority. And this, of course, is a very mixed bag of popes and emperors and many others. But it has been on the increase for centuries all around the world, even in England, through ministers of education, university grants committees, lay boards, boards of trustees and regents, and so forth. Many different devices have been used. Through all these devices, public influences have been asserted in university affairs. Public influence has increased as much in Paris as student influence has declined in Bologna. Everywhere, with the partial exception of Oxford and Cambridge, the ultimate authority now lies in the public domain. Everywhere, with a few exceptions, it is fortunately not exercise in an ultimate fashion. We have, however, come a long way from the guilds of masters, the guilds of students, the guilds of masters and students. The location of power has generally moved from inside to outside the original community of masters and students. The nature of the multiversity makes it inevitable that this historical transfer will not be reversed in any significant fashion. The distribution of power is of great importance. In Germany, it came to be lodged too completely in the figure of the full professor at one end and the minister of education at the other. In Oxford and Cambridge at one time, in the oligarchy of professors, of senior fellows. In the United States during a substantial period, almost exclusively in the president. In Latin America too often, in the students within and the politicians without. The proper power structure is as important as the proper functions. Beyond the students, beyond the faculty, beyond the lay boards, lie all the external influences that come to bear upon a modern university. The alumni, the professional societies, the foundations, the press, 
and many more. The multiversity has many publics with many interests and by the very nature of the multiversity, many of these interests are quite legitimate, others quite frivolous. Then beyond that, there has been rising the separate and distinct class of administrators. Once upon a time, there was very little, almost no administration as such in the college or the university. Today, that's been greatly changed. The general rule is that the administration everywhere becomes by force of circumstances, if not of choice, a more prominent feature of the university. As the institution becomes larger, administration becomes more formalized and separated as a distinct function. As it becomes more complex, the role of the administration becomes more central in trying to integrate it. As it becomes more related to the external world, the administration assumes the burdens of these relationships. The managerial revolution has been going on also in the university. Now I should like to turn to some comments on the American Multiversity President, which I have a subtitle, Giant or Mediator. And I think I should confess in advance that my view of all this may be uh, affected by my own background, having engaged before I became chancellor and later president in nearly hundreds of uh, industrial disputes as a mediator and arbitrator. And sometimes my old friends will see me and uh, ask me how it feels not to be mediating and arbitrating anymore. Don't I miss it? And I tell them, well, I'm actually doing more mediation and arbitration than I ever did, but there are some differences. First of all, I get paid an awful lot less per case than I used to. <laughs> Second place, I can no longer leave town once I've rendered my decision. <laughs> In the third place, uh, there are some techniques available to the mediator or arbitrator which are not entirely appropriate on the university campus and illustrate. Once upon a time, I was at uh, the Carlton Hotel in Washington on a labor relations problem and uh, across one of the rooms on the first floor, there was a friend of mine who got up rather unsteadily on his feet and uh, kind of weaved his way across and finally, after several attempts, grabbed my hand and said, Clark, are you working on an industrial relations problem or are you sober? <laughs> So you, you miss some things <laughs> when you mediate and arbitrate in the university. To show how relevant, however, the experience may be, I was once upon a time the impartial chairman on the Pacific Coast waterfront, back in the days of the old look when it was really class warfare. And when you were halfway between the Waterfront Employers Association and the International Longshoremen's Union of Harry Bridges, you were a long way from anybody else. And one day I went in and saw on the docket an unusual kind of case. Most of them were grievances, or as in the waterfront, they call them beefs. This one was different. It was a wage reopening case, rather than the usual grievance. So I said to the parties in my inno innocence, this is a rather special type of case. Uh, have you uh, tried to negotiate it? And they looked at me in some surprise, though I didn't know anything about the waterfront. Negotiate? And I said, well, I might be somewhat old-fashioned, but I never yet arbitrated this kind of case without the parties trying to settle it first. And I wouldn't take this one on. They, they better negotiate. So they said uh, somewhat reluctantly, uh, all right, we'll negotiate. So I got up to leave the room so they could negotiate. And they said, sit down. This won't take long. <laughs> so I sat down. and. Mr. Foisey representing the Waterfront Employers Association reading across the table to Mr. Bridges. He said, Mr. Bridges, we don't know what you're going to demand, but by God, the answer's no. <laughs> and then Mr. Bridges leaned back across the table and he said, to tell the truth, Mr. Foisey, we haven't yet up, made up our minds what we are going to demand, but by God, we won't take no for an answer. <laughs> and then they turned to me and said, Mr. Impartial Chairman, there's your case we've negotiated. <laughs> I might say in meetings of the Academic Senate and the Board of Regents, I've often thought back on this experience. <laughs> now, it is sometimes said that the American multiversity president is a two-faced character. 
This is not so. If he were, he could not survive. He is a many-faced character <laughs> in the sense that he must face in many directions at once while contriving to turn his back on no important group. The American University president is expected to be a friend of the students, a colleague of the faculty, a good fellow with the alumni, a sound administrator with the trustees, a good speaker with the public, an astute bargainer with the foundations and the federal agencies, a politician with the state legislature, a friend of industry, labor, and agriculture, a persuasive diplomat with donors, a champion of education generally, a supporter of the professions, particularly of law and medicine, a spokesman to the press, a scholar in his own right, a public servant at the state and national levels, a devotee of the opera and football equally, <laughs> a decent human being, a good husband and father, an active member of a church. Above all, he must enjoy traveling in airplanes, eating his meals in public, and attending public ceremonies. No one can be all of these things, some succeeded being none. He should be firm, yet gentle, sensitive to others, insensitive to himself. Look to the present and the future, yet be firmly planted in the present. He should be both visionary and sound, affable yet reflective. Know the value of a dollar and realize that ideas cannot be bought. <laughs> Inspiring in his visions, yet cautious in what he does. A man of principle, yet able to make a deal. <laughs> a man with broad perspective, who will follow the details conscientiously. A good American, but ready to criticize the status quo fearlessly. A seeker of truth where the truth may not hurt too much. A source of public pronouncements when they do not reflect on his own institution. He should be able to sound like a mouse at home and look like a lion abroad. He is one of the marginal men in a democratic society, of whom there are many others. On the margin of many groups, many ideas, many endeavors, many characteristics. Who is he really? To Flexner, he was a hero figure, a daring pioneer who filled an impossible post, yet some of his accomplishments were little short of miraculous. Thus the forceful president, the Gilman, the Elliot, the Harper. The necessary revolutions came from on high. There should be giants in the groves. To Veblen, he was a captain of erudition, and Veblen did not too, think too well of most kinds of captains. To Upton Sinclair, he was the most universal faker and most variegated prevaricator that has yet appeared in the civilized world. <clears throat> the case for leadership has been strongly put by Hutchins. He said that a university needs a purpose, a vision of the end, and it was up to the president to have this vision. In order to have this vision and put it across, he said that the great moral virtues of a university president for courage, fortitude, justice, and prudence. There were such leaders in higher education. Hutchins was one, Lowell was another, and so was Eliot. When asked by a faculty member of the medical school how it could be, after 80 years of managing its own affairs, the faculty had to accommodate to so many changes, Eliot could answer, there is a new president. Even in Oxford, of all places, as it belatedly adapted to the new world of scholarship, Jowett, the famous classicist, as Master Balliol, could set as his rule, never retract, never explain, get it done and let them howl. Bryce could comment in his American Commonwealth on the great authority of the president of the American University, on his almost monarchical position. But the day of the monarchs is past the day when Benjamin Ide Wheeler could ride his white horse across the Berkeley campus, or Nicholas Murray Butler ruled from Morningside Heights. Flexner rather sadly recorded this. He said the day of the excessively autocratic president is over. He has done a great service. Instead of the not always so agreeable autocracy, there is now the usually benevolent bureaucracy, 
as with so much of the rest of the world. Instead of the captain of erudition, or even Reisman's staff sergeant, there is the captain of the bureaucracy, who is sometimes a galley slave on his own ship. And as Reisman has also said, no great revolutionary figure is likely to appear. The role of giant was never a happy one. Hutchins concluded that the administrator had many ways to lose and no way to win, and came to acknowledge that patience, which he once called a delusion and a snare, was also a virtue. It is one thing to get things done, it is another to make them last. The experience of Tappan at Michigan, who before the Civil War tried to do for Michigan what Elliot later did for Harvard and Gilman for Hopkins, the experience of Tappan at Michigan was typical of many, as President Angel, one of his successors, saw it. He said, Tappan was the largest figure of a man that ever appeared on the Michigan campus, and he was stung to death by gnats. The giant was seldom popular with the faculty and often barely opposed, as in the revolution against Wheeler at California. And faculty government gained strength as faculties gained distinction. The experiences of Tappan, Wheeler, Hutchins, even Thomas Jefferson are part of the law of the university presidency, as are those of Wayland who resigned from Brown in frustration after vainly trying something new, of Woodrow Wilson with all his battles over innovations at Princeton and many others. There are more elements to conciliate, fewer in a position to be led. The university has become the multiversity, and the nature of the presidency has followed this change. A complicated organism may need a brain. A machine does not, but it needs some other things, including grease and a mechanic, even a grease monkey. Also, the times have changed. The giants were innovators during a wave of innovation, to use phrases from Schumpeter. The American university required vast renovation to meet the needs of the changing and growing nation. As Eliot said in his inaugural address, the university must accommodate itself promptly to significant changes in the character of the people for whom it exists. And the title of Wilson's inaugural address was Princeton for the Nation's Service. They and others helped take what had been denominational colleges and turn them into modern national universities. They were not inventors, the Germans did the inventing, but they came along at a stage in history when massive innovation was the order of the day. Academic government has taken the form of the guild, as in the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge until recent times, of the manor in Columbia under Butler, and of the United Nations, as in the modern multiversity. There are several nations of students, of faculty, of alumni, of trustees, of public groups, each has its territory, its jurisdiction, its form of government. Each can declare war on the others. Some have the power of veto. Each can settle its own problems by a majority vote, but altogether they form no single constituency. It is a pluralistic society with multiple cultures. Coexistence is more likely than unity. Peace is one priority item, progress another. And the president of the multiversity becomes more than anything else the mediator. The first task of the mediator is peace. How he may the two and seventy jarring sects confute. Peace within the student body, the faculty, the trustees, and peace between and among them. Peace between the two cultures and the three cultures and their subcultures. Among all the ideas competing for support. Peace between the internal environment of the academic community and the external society that surrounds and sometimes almost engulfs it. But peace has its attributes. There is the workable compromise of the day that resolves the current problem. Beyond this lies the effective solution that enhances the long-run distinction and character of the institution. In seeking it, there are some things that should not be compromised, like freedom and quality. Then the mediator needs to become the gladiator. And the dividing lines between these two roles may not be as clear as crystal, but they are at least as fragile, as I know from my own sad experience. The second task is progress. Institutional and personal survival are not enough. A multiversity is inherently a conservative institution, but with radical functions. There are so many groups with a legitimate interest in the status quo, so many veto groups, 
Yet the university must serve a knowledge explosion and a population explosion simultaneously. The president becomes the central mediator among the values of the past, the prospects for the future, and the realities of the present. The mediator among groups and institutions moving at different rates of speed and sometimes in different directions. A carrier of change as infectious and sometimes as feared as a typhoid Mary. He is not an innovator for the sake of innovation, but he must be sensitive to the fruitful innovation. He has no new and bold vision of the end. He is driven more by necessity than by voices in the air. Innovation may be the historical measurement of success, the great characterizing feature of the giants of the past, but innovations sometimes succeed best when they have no obvious author. The quality of the mediation is subject to judgment on two grounds, the keeping of the peace and the furthering of progress, the resolution of interpersonal, intergroup warfare, and the reconciliation of the tug of the anchor of the past with the pull of the holy grail of the future. Unfortunately, peace and progress are more frequently enemies than friends. And since in the long run, progress is more important than peace to a university, the effective mediator must, at times, sacrifice peace to progress. The ultimate test is whether the mediation permits progress to be made fast enough and in the right directions, whether the needed innovations take precedence over the conservatism of the institution. Mediators, while less dramatic than giants, nevertheless are not a homogenized group. They only look that way. Not all presidents seek to be mediators amid their complexities. One famous president succeeded at being at home only five months and five years. Some find it more pleasant to attend meetings, visit projects abroad, even give lectures at other universities. While at home, they attend ceremonial functions and go to the local clubs and allow the winds of controversy to swirl past them. Others look for visions, but most are in the control tower, helping their real pilots make their landings without crashes, even in the fog. Hutchins wrote of the four moral virtues for university president, which I quoted a few moments ago. I should like to suggest a slightly different three judgment, courage, and fortitude. But the greatest of these is fortitude, since others have so little charity. The mediator, whether in government or industry or labor relations or domestic quarrels, is always subject to some abuse. He wins few clear-cut victories. He must aim more at avoiding the worst than seizing the best. The president of multiversity must be content to hold its constituent elements loosely together and to move the whole enterprise another foot ahead in what often seems an unequal race with history. What is the justification of the modern American multiversity? History is one answer. Consistency with the surrounding society is another. Beyond that, it has few peers in the preservation and dissemination and examination of the eternal truths. No living peers in the search for new knowledge, and no peers in all history among institutions of higher learning in serving so many of the segments of an advancing civilization. Inconsistent internally as an institution, it is consistently productive. Torn by change, it has a stability of freedom. Without a single soul to call its own, its members pay their devotions to truth. For well, the multiversity, in conclusion, is perhaps best seen at work, adapting and growing, as it responded to the massive impact of federal programs beginning with World War II. A vast transformation has taken place without a revolution, for a time almost without notice being taken. The multiversity has demonstrated how adaptive it can be to new opportunities for creativity, how responsive to money, how eagerly it can play a new and useful role, how fast it can change while pre pretending that nothing has happened at all, how fast even it can neglect some of its ancient virtues. What are the current realities of the Federal Grant University? And this will be our topic for tomorrow evening. Thank you.
You've just heard the first of three Godkin lectures for 1963, sponsored by the Graduate School of Public Administration at Harvard University, and delivered by Clark Kerr, President of the University of California. The speaker was introduced by Nathan M. Pusey, President of Harvard University. The title of tonight's lecture was The Idea of the Multiversity. It was brought to you by WGBH TV and FM from Sanders Theatre in Cambridge. This program was pre-recorded.